Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for our first webinar of the new year. I hope you guys have had a well-rested holiday. Today's webinar is titled Why Customer Data is the Next Battleground for Digital Banking. And special thanks to the speakers for taking the time to share their views with us and also Personetics for sponsoring this session as well. Now, these days, you know, if you look at banks, they're all either fully digital or digitized to a very large extent. Uh, providing customers digital channels to just interact with you or perform tra financial transaction is no longer uh, a selling feature, but just a basic function that a lot of consumers expect, right? So these days, in order to delight and retain customers, banks need to look at better ways to harness customer data to deliver superior experience. Joining us today uh, to share their insights and experience right up on top there, we have Henry Nguyen. Henry Nguyen is the uh, CEO of Timo which is one of Vietnam's first digital banks. And below him, we have Karnak Surendran, who is the regional head for digital at CIMB, which is Malaysia's second largest bank. And below Karnak, we have Doral Blitz, who is the VP for uh, Strategy and Business Development at Personatics. They specialize in self-driving finance, which I'm sure Doral will tell us more about later. And below Doral, we have Heyman Fong, who is the Chief Customer Officer at Mox, one of Hong Kong's leading digital banks. Folks, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thank Happy you. to have all of you here. Thank you. So maybe before we start by jumping into the questions, uh, just to congratulate two gentlemen that's on the panel today to a very auspicious start to the new year. Henry, of course, your company have raised uh, 20 million US dollars, if I'm not mistaken. And yes. Dorel, you guys have a big announcement coming up today as well, right? Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have... Um, we are about to announce later on today another uh, major growth fundraising by one of the world's largest uh, private equity firms. And that's really grow, uh, growing strong in the market today with uh, over 80 banks in 30 markets. So the, this is really great. Thank you, Vincent. Wonderful. We look forward to uh, seeing the news later. So maybe we can start with Henry, who is right on top there. Henry, can you give us a broad sense of what are the trends that you're seeing around banks harnessing data right now? Uh, specifically, maybe you can give us some examples on what you observe in, in Vietnam. Sure. Um, you know, obviously, you know, everybody talks about big data. Everybody talks about machine learning and AI. Uh, and all these uh, tools obviously are getting filtered into uh, all sorts of banking services at every level. So it's everything from credit checks. Um, for us, actually, a big part of this is also using tools to uh, identify even patients from the very onboarding process. Um, you know, obviously, in Vietnam, there's a couple of companies that were sort of uh, at the forefront of of connecting with the telcos and using that that as a data source. So even for us, as we onboard customers, we often have uh, a decent picture or background on mm -hmm. someone uh, the moment they start to uh, register for an account with Timo. Um, so it's everything from customer engagement for uh, credit scoring, other types of, of uh, database analysis on our customer background and their journey. Uh, in terms of their wants and needs as a uh, as a, cons a banking consumer, so I can see it uh, obviously becoming increasingly important, particularly as the marketplace gets more competitive. For sure, and it's only going to get even more competitive as we go along, right? Yeah. So the importance become even more apparent. Thanks for that, Henry. Let's move on to Kanax. Uh, Kanax, give us a sense of uh, some of the broad trends in this area right now. Okay. Uh... Thanks for that, um, Vincent. I think, um, you know, this is the next battleground. I mean, there's no no two questions about it. As you rightly pointed out, uh, all that is to be done to get the basics on running is, is, is all done. Uh, and uh, uh, if I look at uh, this, this space around uh, retail consumer banking and uh, if you look at the players, there are essentially uh, three sets of players. You have the traditional banks, you have the uh, the distribution uh, organizations, uh, super apps, and then you have the upcoming uh, digital banks, which have uh, licenses in some market and some markets yet to be announced. Uh, but you essentially have these three broad spectrum. And as you would have uh, looked at, uh, when you look at these players, uh, the challenge that traditional banks, at least where I come from, what we face is, is access to distribution. And what uh, many of these super apps and other providers who have millions of customers with them have is that access to distribution. And 
the only way uh, for these players to make banking relevant or be where uh, where the customer is and give them what the what they want at the right time is really understand their customer base. And so, uh, data becomes your, your fundamental uh, differentiating uh, uh, you know baseline. And if you don't know what to do with data, doesn't matter who you are, uh, you're fundamentally going to be left behind. So it's because you know ten years back it's about what can you do with UX and what can you do with the mobile app. Now it really is what you can do with data, uh, and 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 not in the you know in a in a bad sense, but really uh, differentiating that in two ways. Right, one is what can you understand about the customers that you have within the organization, uh, within your user base, so that you know what to uh, go to them with as an express offer or an express solution, and two, what is the value add that you can provide to your customer by giving them insights that they don't know anything about. Um, so these are two different uh, angles, uh, 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 lenses to look at. And um, I see, if you, when I look at trends, that everyone trying to do a bit of both. And uh, and that's pretty much the, uh, whoever has got the best uh, ML engines uh, seems to get the best on the other side, which is figuring out what's the next product, what's the product model, what's the next uh, product to sell. But, the aspect around helping the customer figuring out what they need to know is still quite, uh, um, you know, it's a, we're just scratching the surface there. Um, and that's pretty much where uh, most of the work that needs to be done. And that's where the gap is. Thank you for that. Certainly, we've seen the conversation shift from UI, UX to data, right? And of course, certainly UI and UX is very important. But these days, I feel like if you don't even have that right, it's like you are you are not able to compete with everyone else and really where you stand out is how you harness the data to deliver these experiences right thanks for that Kanax. um let's let's move on to dorel who um, perhaps can give us a more global view based on the clients that you've worked with right well, what's your sense on how banks and financial services are harnessing uh, customer data these days I think the um, I think the yeah. question is what exactly is the data, um, and from our perspective, I think I think from our perspective the question is what exactly is the data, and I think that what we are seeing today is that for so many years banks didn't really able, were able to leverage their biggest asset, their biggest gold mine, which is their own customers' financial transactional data, and what you are actually seeing in most of the banks they are using basically you know generic um, uh, marketing data, um, but they are not really able to smartly, proactively, precisely engage with their customers about their ongoing situation or upcoming situation. And where we are coming in as Personetics, and that's actually what we are seeing aligning with the global trends, Vincent, is exactly doing that. How to leverage this amazing goldmine of customers' day-to-day -day financial transactional data from different multiple data sources, including open banking, including cloud accounting softwares for the small business owners, how to aggregate, normalize, provide a one holistic deep financial view of the customers. And only for that, that's an amazing, you know, um, uh, opportunities and advantages for the banks. And then like exactly like uh, Kanak said, how to help banks to move from a very reactive approach into finally a smart, proactive uh, financial data-driven approach and to help, you know, on one hand, to help customers, people like you and me, to better manage their financial life, to stay on top of their finance, to help customers to improve their financial wellness, well-being. And on the other side, how banks can better sell, how banks can better service. And it's not just next best action, next best offer. It's also the next best interaction. It's the next best engagement. So it's really about to stay much more close and move from a reactive to proactive approach. Um, and by doing so, by staying much more close with the customers, we believe that's the battleground today for banks all over the world. That's exactly where they can differentiate themselves. This is where they can provide much more uh, personalized uh, uh, interactions and much better products and services. Certainly, right? Because I would prefer for my bank to 
you know, if they notice I have excess funds in my bank account to offer me some wealth services instead of promoting me the same credit cards over and over again. So I feel like, yeah, definitely if you're able to harness the kind of data, you can deliver the right kind of experience. Thanks for that, Daryl. Let's move on to Heyman's. And Heyman's, I think, you know, looking at Hong Kong is always a little bit like looking in the future for us in Malaysia because you guys have already launched the digital banking licenses, right? So yeah, I'd love to hear from you. What, what are some of the trends that you've observed around uh, this space? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, in terms of the trends, um, I think customers now is the day one service and products that are personalized, smart, safe, fun, and with speed. I guess, especially in Hong Kong, everyone wants everything yesterday. Um, so when we launched the bank, <laughs> uh, speed is something that um, we work very hard to achieve speed in terms of everything, in terms of the onboarding journey, in terms of approval of credit, in terms of approval of loan products, uh, and data help us to do that. And to be able to harness uh, the right data and also to leverage on like machine learning and data analytics actually help us a lot in terms of, as I said, onboarding as well as um, access to credit line assignments. So this is number one area, which is huge for us. And then another huge area for us is uh, personalization. Uh, you, exactly as you said, uh, knowing our customers' behavior and their financial transactions to be able to personalize customer offer as well as to do a more appropriate uh, cross-sell, upsell. So that's the number two areas. I think number three areas, which is also very big, um, it's on customer engagement. Uh, how do we uh, engage our customers at the right moment and with the right content? That's more on the marketing space, but that's also important because our credit card works with a lot of merchants and we have many, many different offers. And if we just like um, blast out the same offers to every customers on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, that's kind of boring. And that's what traditional banks do and we don't want to do that. Um, so slowly, slowly, uh, we also like observe our customers observe uh, their spend pattern and observe um, their behavior and then to craft the right offers and to craft the right comps setting out to our customers. So these are the three areas um, that we are doing and we also see that uh, even Ming Bangs and I guess that's almost the chance uh, for the customer expectations these days. Thanks, Eamon. I really appreciate that. And I think I can kind of watch for how Hong Kong demands speed, right? Just looking at the general population, you're walking on the street and everybody's walking 10 times faster than me, I'm sure. That's also reflected in the demand for financial services as well. Um, thanks for sharing those examples. I think um, next, I would like to kind of dive into how your particular banks are using data, right? So maybe let's start with Henry Carnax and then some examples from Dorel's clients and then back to Heyman's. Uh, Henry, can you share with us maybe some of the examples of how Timo has harnessed data and, and what are some of the outcomes? Well, I, I think Heyman's has hit on a lot of it. You know, mm. it's the personalization piece, I think, is what's really key. Um, all of us obviously want to create services that are very relevant and, and meaningful and valuable to our customers. Um, and obviously, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? Um, if we can build a fuller, richer picture of you through your transaction history, uh, through all, you know, all the different ways that you spend, uh, for instance, then we can figure out what are the right messages to put in front of you in terms of, as Heyman said, you know, I love uh, eating out in restaurants, but if you keep pushing me messages about you know, discounts on grocery stores, it falls on deaf ears. And in fact, it probably becomes an annoyance, right? Um, but if you're sharing with me something that I clearly am interested in and care about, um, and of course the response rates there and all those things end up being very important, uh, being able to build the true feedback loops, that's another uh, important aspect of, of putting the data to work. So, uh, you know, on a generic level, it's great to talk about data. And I think we all love talking about it, but trying to get the right data at the right time, uh, look at it the right way, and then really what I'll say perform feedback tests. Um, that's been kind of the challenge for us because there's tons of data there, but what are we actually doing that 
we know is very clearly through feedback and through other mechanisms of, of customer touch points, knowing that we're doing something relevant, meaningful for our customers, changing behavior. And of course, then as a business, obviously creating more use cases uh, and also uh, maximizing uh, our revenue opportunities with certain customers. Thanks for that, Henry. And I think certainly, like you said, right, a lot of us can talk about how to do this on a very high level, but certainly there are a lot of different challenges that banks face in terms of how to go about managing this kind of data. And I'd like to dive a bit into that a bit later. But uh, maybe in the meantime, let's uh, have Kanax on stage and uh, hear how CIMB harnesses uh, data for their customers. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. Uh, I mean, see, the, I think when uh, Henry Hamans, uh, they all spoke about this, and it's, it's, this is not, I think the structure of the strategy is not rocket science, it's more of the execution, uh, really. Um, and so uh, if you really strategize and if you say what you're going to use data for, it's, it's around two things. One is how do you create value for customers, and two is how do you create value for the bank. And uh, I mean, I, I just keep going to that same thing because I, at the end of the day, everything falls into those things, uh, those two buckets. Now, uh, how do you create value for the customer um, is, is really around being there where he wants, uh, where, where, uh, where, he, where he wanted to be and uh, where he wants us to be. And, and that's what we call as personalization, hyper-personalization, it takes different facets and it's, uh, the use cases differ from uh, banks to banks and, and, and uh, markets to markets. Um, uh, but eventually for us, it's about a few areas, right? One is how do you delight the customer uh, once he's already with you? And what do you do to um, make his life uh, easier? Uh, do we give uh, reminders for payments? You know that he makes a payment for his credit card on this date every month. Um, and if you know he's not done it, uh, there is a clear case for you to send a reminder. Um, in, my, in for, for example, in, uh, in Malaysia, so we, we have a daily uh, set of rules. We have a weekly set of rules. We have these monthly rules. And then you have these annual, and then you have these ad hoc rules. Uh, one example of an annual rule that the bank has set up is uh, we send you uh, your tax relief for reminder. In Malaysia, at the end of the uh, year, so we look at all your credit card and debit card and account spends, and we send you an email which tells you that hey, you have spent so much on you know books, so much on, on medical and these things, and these are all uh, tax deductible, uh, and you get and you know get your uh, stuff ready for your next uh, tax, you know tax tax cycle. So things like that, and those are uh, emails that actually have shown us 35 percent click through on open rates and EDMs. Uh, if you know, if you're a marketer, if you get even a 5% click-through rate, that's amazing. And for us to get a 35% click-through rate uh, shows that it is actually creating value and it's meaningful. So it's about identifying those touch points where you can create those those, those values and being able to uh, succinctly, you know, engage with customers. And that's where the uh, the the execution challenge lies. And that you can only get through a continuous test and learn approach. Uh, and investing significantly in those in those activities. So for us, uh, obviously, there's a bunch of things that you do, which is about what's the next product to buy, next product to sell, what's the propensity for this customer to take on a credit card. Um, you know, can you can this guy uh, or this customer uh, uh, move up the scale into the wealth investment? So those are models that you have, and you are, and those are reactive and proactive uh, sales processes. But really, it's about this predictive behavior and personalization. That's where the differentiation lies, and those are the areas that uh, we at least are spending a lot of our time on right now. Okay. Uh, certainly that's a good uh, kind of service to provide consumers, right? Because at the end of the day, you can save some on taxes. Who who would be upset on that? And I don't even remember when's the last time I opened my bank's email. So I guess 35% 35, 35 is, is a really uh, good opening. Right? <laughs> well, thanks for that, Canucks. Let's, uh, let's move on to Dorel. Dorel, I mean, you've worked with so many clients, right? What are, what are some examples of use cases you can uh, share with us? Yeah, I think maybe two uh, two examples. One of them is um, um, one of our clients in the region is a UOB, uh, and now they also acquired some of the work of uh, you know some of the local clients of uh, Citibank, so they are even growing faster. So with UOB, we are working across the broad uh, across the board in on different you know segments in UOB tomorrow and UOB in Singapore and and uh, and others. And as an example, just one of them, um, uh, UOB is really uh, leveraging the you know the future or, or, or our vision. Of personetic self-driving finance and this is really goes beyond just you know alerts and recommendations and basic insights this is really take to the next level of leveraging data uh, in the digital banking space is where actually banks can uh, very similar to self-driving cars banks will be able to become a self-driving finance and even think and act 
on behalf of their customers and helping customers to even automatically, uh, completely automatically save for the future or cut a debt or invest. And customers don't need to set up goals and threshold and time limit and all of that. And we believe that's the future. Again, the five steps of self-driving car maybe will be applicable to the way that we look on banks. And uh, we really appreciate the same vision of UB taking that into the next level and able to quickly deploy all sorts of these automated, self-adjustable um, um, wellness programs. And again, the ability to, un to understand where customers can have maybe have some excess funds in their own checking accounts or even through open banking connected other accounts and the ability to identify variable amounts of money to moving them into all sorts of, uh, you know, um, savings or investment, robo-advisory and trading and, and debt reduction, uh, automated pockets, and the ability even to split these kind of monies into different goals if the customers had. So it's really about, again, the, the vision of how banks should fulfill their customers' expectations and maybe the social contract. And like you said, Vincent, you would love that your bank won't just become your uh, real-time financial advisor, but even, you know, we'll take all the burden from you to the bank, to the technology, to the human being, to this hybrid model, and we'll just help you to, you know, to live your life and help you to move from a FOMO, fear of missing out, into JOMO, joy of missing out, where you can finally sit back and relax, and your bank will be there for you, will anticipate, think for you, act on behalf of you, and help you to, to, to live your life. So that's one example from UB. Another one across, you know, from other region is as an example, US Bank, one of the largest banks in the US. And they also acquired another bank recently. And US Bank, they are using six different business solutions of Personetics. One of them is actually an automated saving program. Now it's running around millions of clients. And again, customers don't need to do anything. Again, it's only one click even connect external bank accounts and we, our analytical models and our cash flow predictions and so on and so forth can identify different pockets of money and on cup, every couple of days, and it can be a lot of money even, we can move that into different accounts, we can split, we can manage that and helping customers automatically, of course, they can always pause, they can always stop, but helping them to automatically um, you know, build their own financial resilience. For sure, right? And I think, you know, when we think about a lot of the banks who say they're targeting mil millennials and they're like, oh, the way we're targeting millennials is by going digital, is, is by having this great UI, UX, because it's cool, all millennials want to go digital. But what a lot of these banks, when they put this messaging out there, they don't realize that a lot of us are like in our 30s, even approaching our 40s. <laughs> we're going to have children, right? And we want to start planning for our wealth. So how, how do banks kind of fit into that picture and use the data to provide the kind of services? So those are certainly some really good points. Thanks for that, Dorel. Let's move on to Heyman's. And, you know, Heyman's, I'm sure you have a lot of examples for us being one of the leading digital banks in the Hong Kong. Uh, why don't you walk us through some of the case studies that you have for us? Sure. Um, I really agree what, uh, I guess, it's kind of said about it's really the execution and the implementation that matters because on high level strategic wise we all know like what and where we want to be but uh it's really the bank whether we can actually deliver i have a, a case study uh that i can talk about it's about uh credit card approval uh when we uh did when we like before we opened the bank we did a lot of research and like we asked our customers, what are the pain points, right? That's very uh, basic. And one of the pain points is people find it very troublesome to need to send in documentations, income proof, address proof, and then wait for two days or three days uh, to get the card approved and then send the card over for another week. So it's what, a one week or one and a half weeks process the soonest with traditional bank. And uh, because Hong Kong people want speed, uh, so we we really looked into how we can um, shorten this whole credit card approval process. Uh, and the way we did it was really uh, with data. So just I, I give a little bit of um, technicality or some details. You know, when it comes to use of data for credit card approval, usually uh, for most banks, I guess you look at your customers' uh, credit risk rating provided by the local uh, credit bureau. You look at your credit risk parameters as the bank's uh, own risk appetite. Usually these two things, the combinations, 
uh, and then you run uh, uh, all the data behind, and then you you know you make a decision. Uh, and for us, uh, we use these two. Plus, we also look at the um, data in terms of the estimated income, plus some of the usage behavior data. And because of these two extra data points, uh, it's, it helps us to make a better decisions. And then, of course, we have to uh, uh, rely on machine learning. And we did a lot of testing. It's not like we got it right away. We did a lot, a lot of testing and also to uh, match it with uh, the usual like bank um, credit risk rating uh, to find a level that we're comfortable uh, to be able to give such a decision in within one minute. So uh, the end experience for now is a person uh, with our uh, account they only need to press three buttons and wait for maximum two minutes. Uh, we can get the credit card application approved and without them sending us over additional documents. And because it's a digital card, so they can choose to put the card on their uh, Apple wallet and they can use it right away. It still takes time to send the card over uh, physical mail. It takes about around like three days. Um, but at least because of, uh, as I said, because of the additional data points that we use, and the way that we look at how we um, put the data together, uh, and with the help of like AI, of course, uh, and also the risk appetite that uh, we take, it's a business decision, which enable us to shorten uh, the whole process uh, to minutes and just like a few buttons. There is a rule within the bank that whatever we want our customers to do, it has to be completed within two minutes and less than five buttons. From a you know from a UX uh, uh, perspective, so that's one of the yeah that, that that's one of the uh, and and that's why we are in now we are still in Hong Kong, uh, the fastest bank uh, for account opening and also for credit card and loan approval. I think certainly um, you know one of the areas that is, is a good experience is also the speed in which you are able to interact with your bank right so being able to open accounts that quickly i think is definitely a good experience i mean personally you know when, when we talk about data we're not even looking at very complex things right i have an experience where i tried to apply for a mortgage i got my mortgage approval and i need to open a a current account with the bank, I need to show up at the branch to give the same information again, right? So I think certainly if we are able to use customer data and, and use alternative sources of data to, to help with this kind of uh, onboarding process, it would uh, certainly be good as well. Now, um, we have over 200 people tuning in from YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and various channels. Um, so if anyone have any questions, feel free to uh, comment on our YouTube link and um, I'll try to direct it uh, best I can to the rest of the speakers. It seems uh, Henry has dropped off for a moment, so my clicks will check in on him and see if he's able to dial back in. Uh, in the meantime, maybe we can move on to Canucks. And, and earlier, you know, Henry was talking a little bit about some of the challenges that uh, banks face, right? So, I'm, of course, in your journey to be more data driven, Canucks, I'm sure you've also encountered a, a few obstacles uh, in CIMB. So, maybe walk us through that journey, some of the challenges, and, and, and some of the ways you've uh, overcome this challenges within your bank okay um it's an interesting question um because the challenges have not gone away they're still around right um uh, so i mean see are they you know 10 years or 12 years back um, i was in the bank and we were launching a mobile app for the first time in the market a smartphone app uh, i couldn't even get five million us dollar funding um, because people question the value of smartphone banking um, and, um, uh, you know, it, it but then, uh, I'm sure the same people now who questioned are leading, uh, uh, digital transformation in those organizations. Uh, so it takes time, uh, for people to appreciate and learn and figure out, especially when you have, uh, uh um, you know, a disruptive innovation sitting in front of you, a disruptive you know, a model sitting in front of you. So the primary what I'm going with that is uh, the few challenges that 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 were there in the beginning was really trying to um, create a structure inside organizations where you can say spending so much money in in something uh, is is actually going to create value down the line and you don't have any 
uh, baseline for you to prove that is actually going to be the case. So you are expecting a whole bunch of folks uh, to, to trust your gut and trust uh, that this is where the world is moving. And, and, and to make that step uh, is a big ask, uh, especially in an organization where there is always uh, challenges around where the money, because there's enough things to invest in. Uh, how do you know this is the right thing to invest? That's, that's, the, that's the, you know, the question that needs to be answered. So the first one is trying to convince people and figuring out that actually there is, uh, there is value here. Um, so you need to find uh, clear stakeholders who are willing to take that bet and who are willing to test and learn from a small point of view. That's number one. Number two, uh, once you get that, is in an organization like uh, like who we are or any traditional bank, your infrastructure and ecosystem of 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 uh, technology has been built over decades. So for you to get a single point of view of data uh, is not going to be easy. Uh, it's very different when you're a, uh, when you're a startup. Uh, because you have built a data model and you're structuring your investment, you're structuring your IT architecture right from that from day one. In an organization which has been around for you know for dozens of years, it's going to be a challenge really getting your information architecture right, information um, layers right, and connecting these archaic platforms uh, you know across to pull this data and and being able to do that in real time because that's where the the real meat is. Uh, obviously, first is getting it uh, to a stage where you're able to create sense of the data and create models. Number two is being able to do that in real time. So that's the second challenge. The third challenge is really coming down to, to people. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we, as I said, we have uh, super apps, we have uh, fintechs, we have uh, uh, in, across industries, uh, not only just banks, everybody looking for the same talent, whether it is digital, whether it's agile, whether it is DevOps, and whether it is design on data it's the same set of folks so you have a situation where there is a dearth of talent uh, across all markets and across uh, industries so yeah I mean, somebody's earning 20 times more uh, every year because they just were able to move uh, but but the point is there is challenge with uh, with resources so how do you solve for that in an effective manner and, and be able to train people so that you not only are able to move fast but also give those Folks who are with you, especially in these industry, uh, in the in the data space and digital space, a career that actually makes sense because, uh, especially in, in organizations like uh, like traditional banks, uh, these career paths are just very nascent. Uh, so, to, to how do you create a structure that that helps them move along? So, these three are, in my opinion, the, the biggest challenges that uh, you face. You faced, and you, I think, we continue to face. Um, thank you. For sure, thank you for that kind of. And I think, you know, on the theme of uh, talking about asking for investment, uh, five million or whatever, there's no shortage of department heads all saying that their project is the most important thing for the bank right now, right? So it's always a challenge yeah. to, to to get the kind of budget out. And of course, talent is a big thing. Um, I like to dive into that a little bit uh, later as well. Because, you know, these days, the tech companies are borderless, right? Especially with the COVID-19, they're all like, oh, you can uh, work in Malaysia and then serve a company that's in Dubai or US. And just a currency alone is hard for a lot of local companies or banks to compete for this kind of talents, right? So there's so many moving parts that we need to consider as well. Thanks thanks for your views. Uh, now that we got Henry back on. Henry, why don't you walk us through uh, some of the challenges that you've come across, you know, in, in being more data driven, how you've overcome this kind of obstacles and whatnot. You have the floor, Henry. Sure. Um, you know, uh, like I said, the hardest part of, obviously is, you know, one is just getting access to the right data uh, uh, in more traditional banking platforms. And we obviously partnered in the beginning with uh, a much more traditionally structured bank um, was already very difficult, right? Um, one of the big push uh, that we made to, to migrate to Bamboo as, as our core uh, banking platform was just the greater flexibility and the ability to kind of slice and dice all the data uh, in the way that we needed to. And that modern kind of architecture allows you to do that uh, in, in so much more, uh, you know, simple and, and straightforward ways. So going back to then, you know, never mind data accessibility is one challenge I think most institutions have. Now, now what do you do with it? And the hardest part still, and, I'm, and I have to say, you know, we're, we're not where I want us to be or where I think we're going to need to be to be uh, extremely successful is being able to then 
take those data points, uh, do the analysis, come up with the right hypothesis, and then I guess I'll call it put out uh, the marketing experiments, right? Uh, seeing responsivity, we're seeing how we're getting uh, either uh, a confirmation of our hypothesis or uh, a complete, uh, uh, you know, antithesis of it. So uh, that, that to me is, is the key in terms of making sure that you put data to work. Because I think it's super exciting and sexy to be able to kind of come up with all these great charts and graphs. <laughs> um, and some of them, quite frankly, are fascinating to look at because it gives you insight into certain type of needs and behaviors your customers have. Uh, but how do you translate that into, you know, really important and relevant business products, right, and services that, again, ultimately increase your top and bottom line? Uh, and I think once you're able to do that, that's where the magic starts to happen. And for us, we've seen it start to happen. But if I graded us, you know, out of 10, I think we're only probably three out of 10. There's so much more potential in terms of what we can do, what we uh, should do, and quite frankly, competitively, what we're going to likely have to do. We're going to stand out from the crowd and also be more competitive than uh, the digitalization of more traditional banks. And then, of course, you know, newcomers uh, into the marketplace. It's definitely a journey, right? You got to test, validate, and experiment over and over again. And, you know, one day when you reach that elusive 10, the industry would have evolved where the 10 is no longer a 10. So constantly got to pursue that kind of new standard, right? Well, my, my colleagues knowing me, I don't think we'll ever reach 10. So, <laughs> well, Thanks for sharing your challenges, Henry. Let's move on to uh, Heyman's to also share her views as well. Heyman's, you have the floor. Sure. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, before I joined Marks, I work for an insurance company. So I so I experienced uh, hundreds of years organizations with lots of data, but then uh, the different, different systems just don't talk to each other. There's no single source of truth. And, you know, every, every insurance company now is talking about transformation and it's taking them, what, five, ten years transformation. And then I moved to Marx, which is a startup virtual bank. We started only like two years ago. The whole system, everything was built uh, from a more data-driven and customer-centric perspective. So before I came over, I thought, okay, Marx is the answer. It must be heaven in terms of like using data and getting access to data. And, and, and then I realized we have our challenges too. Uh, it's not like we have, we're in the perfect world. Um, yeah, in terms of people and talents, totally agree. So I'm not going to add on to it except to, except to say that, yes, we face the same challenge. Um, I think for us uh, on a data uh, challenge is um, how do we use the data together with our partners? Uh, we have a joint venture partners, um, uh, Hong Kong Telecom, one of the largest uh, telecom company in Hong Kong. Uh, it's also our investor. So, uh, and then trip.com is also an investor. So it's Standard Charter Bank, Trip, and Hong Kong Tea. So if we go out and talk about our lifestyle banking, we're supposed to have like the best, like we have travel data, people like to travel in Hong Kong. We have telecom and mobile data and all this. Um, uh, like theoretically, yes, we do sort of, uh, but it's, it's even for us, it's very hard because of the regulations. Uh, because of different systems, uh, because of course we also need to get consent from our customers, uh, and and once it gets to all these different data, it's it's too much data for us. It can be too much data for us too. So what's the best way to harness this data? Uh, what's the best way to put them together? What's the best way to use them? So we also have our uh, challenge in terms of, as I said, using our partner's data. And, and to be honest, we haven't sorted it out yet. We're still like working on different ways. We're still doing like different testing. And, and same as Henry, uh, I think we are like a two or three <laughs> at this stage. Within our own bank, like if I look at our, my own customers, uh, I would say we, we, of course we still have room to improve, but we're doing a lot and, and, and it's much easier. But when it comes to integrating other partners' data, uh, it's it's hard. It's it's yeah. It's still very hard for us because one again, it's different machines. And then the funny thing is, different industry have different regulations. 
So bank, we have our own banking regulations. And when it comes to telecom, they have their regulations. And, and C-Trip is a China-based company that have the. So it's, um, so, so it's, I, I guess you can imagine. So it's not like uh, it's that easy, even though we're partners. Uh, uh, so in, in that sense, it's, it's one of our biggest challenges that we're trying to solve now. Yeah, I, I, I'm really enjoying this part of our conversation because I feel everybody is just so candid about some of the challenges and there's a lot to learn and I really appreciate uh, your sharing. I'm sure you've uh, had a bit of a whiplash jumping from insurance to a more startup kind of thing. <laughs> Must be an interesting experience. Thanks for that. So it is. It's to... a very interesting experience. If we have more time, maybe we can talk about For it. For sure. Later. I think we can do a whole yeah. session about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amos. Let's move on to Dorel. And then maybe we can move on to some questions from the audience. Dorel, what are some of the uh, challenges you've uh, kind of experienced working with some of your clients? Yeah, first of all, I do have to say, Henry and Hymans, this is really great. I uh, really appreciate it. And I really like to, you know, the this candid approach um, and really sharing your, your, you know, your challenges. I think that's what exactly what people are looking for to, to hear from you. So well done on that. And I, and I really appreciate that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think, um, you know, from our perspective, um, uh, first of all, as a company, as a global uh, growth uh, company that is partnering with uh, banks and digital banks and now also uh, insurance and others globally, I think um, from our perspective, it's always the ability to, uh, you know, to access the financial data, you know, uh, banks are still using all sorts of uh, spaghetti infrastructure and uh, the financial transactional data, even the basic one, you know, even the, la the customer's last six months of financial transactional data, you know, what you are already receiving, Vincent, today in your mobile app, even this kind of data source, in, in some cases, it's being already scattered in, in you know, mainframes and data lakes and so even data swamps. Um, and all sorts of different databases. And I think even, you know, just accessing that, even without moving, because, you know, we do not move the data, we do not duplicate, we are just accessing that. But just the access itself, it's definitely challenging. And I think I do agree with Hyman. you know, once we are doing all of that and you are able to actually analyze everything in one data structure, just to gain like one holistic view of the customers, that's for itself, that's that's the main challenge. I mm. think once you are doing that, then, you know, you can actually, you know, create the specific use cases that you want to provide to your customers. And I, I appreciate what Henry said about that. And I think following what Kanag said, again, I think the next step, the next revolution, the next battleground for digital banking will be much more of, you know, uh, cognitive automation, which means mm. that, you know, I would love my mocks, I would love my Timo, I would love my CIMB to be there for me, to take action on behalf of me. Of course, it's not relevant for all the customers, it's not relevant for all the services, but basically I think we need to acknowledge the notion that we want our banks to, to be much more responsible, if you, if you like, uh, to our life, to our financial life, uh, and helping us, uh, you know, to sit back and relax. Uh, you you spoke about it, right? I have kids, I have dreams, I have needs. I want to take my kids in the summer to uh, to Disneyland, Disney World. Uh, but I don't want to plan ahead. And I, I want I, I don't want to think all day long. How much do I need to save? How much money to calculate things? I just want to know there is someone there, you know, that is helping me to achieve my 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 basic dreams, my basic life. You know, I want a new Tesla car. You know, so I just want. A, a, a technology, a hybrid model, something that will help me to achieve my dreams or maybe to cut my debt or invest. And that's, you know, that's the vision and that's what we as personalities are trying to do. So that's the challenge, you know, just the first access to the data. And then, of course, we are working very closely with our partners and clients to help them uh, to fulfill their dreams, their needs, their strategy, and also making sure that this is really uh, on the spot towards their specific uh, customer base. For sure. And I think, you know, nobody's excited about banking, right? Nobody wakes up like, oh, today I get to deal with Timo. <laughs> today I get to deal with Mox, right? And then it's just what what the bank can help you with your finances and whatnot. So I think that's really a, a solid point that you brought up and all the challenges that associate to, to kind of reach to that level. Thanks for that, Dorel. Um, so maybe right now we can take uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, we can start with this question from Milan. Uh, Milin is asking about how to use customer data to, uh, you know, 
prevent fraud and also to minimize uh, defaults and NPLs in, in lending. Kanax, would you like to take this? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, the reason why I didn't speak about that is that's the boring stuff. But um, but you have to do it because uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's about risk management and uh, it's about the bottom line and, uh, and also about protecting customers. Um, so, uh, I mean, see, a few things uh, that, uh, that I can talk about is um, uh, when it comes to credit, um, uh, there is propensity models that, that are built inside the organization which look at your behavior and and, is, and they're able to identify how close you are to potentially probably defaulting or getting into some kind of a trouble. And uh, uh, those flags get pointed out and then uh, obviously uh, the bankers will have those right conversations with, with the customer to uh, to help you move away from getting into that cycle because uh, that's that's what this is all about. Uh, so that's that's obviously a model that exists. And we, uh, on top of it, uh, we have been experimenting with uh, alternate uh, uh, credit uh, debt modeling using information that we already have about you when you're not a credit uh, customer yet, which is uh, we have your debit data, we have your transaction data on online and mobile banking, we have your purchase information using obviously the cards and uh, uh, clicks and we know uh, based on that we create a model that tells us uh, how good you could be uh, to get a credit card or a loan and uh, and we have been able to use that to, to you know, to uh, reach out to more customers and, and, and issue credit. And that's underserved market because they are not in the credit, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, credit bureau. So there is no way somebody is going to be able to issue credit to, to these folks. But by bringing these underserved or underbanked folks into the uh, loan ecosystem, we're actually increasing the creditable market in some way. So that's that's another example that I can talk about, and specifically on fraud. Uh, um, you know, uh, using behavioral insights to to determine if uh, if you're uh, getting defrauded or if you're getting on a call where you're creating a new PE in the system to whom you are going to be sending thousand bucks to, uh, those are simple rules that uh, that exist in the platform or in the system that automatically uh, captures and we're able to uh, you know limit losses for our customers by by proactively uh, blocking these transactions. Uh, and these are multiple rules and validations that have been put in the system through years and years of you know, understanding what and how these transactions work. But more, more importantly, there's also something that has been that has been done, which is we have created a, a propensity to be frauded model, where we know based on uh, you know your behavior how likely that you could be uh, falling uh, prey to an SMS phishing. Uh, and uh, we have created that model, which is again a machine learning model. Let you test and learn and see how good these models are. And we use that model to, in fact, identify and strengthen our fraud uh, prevention quite a bit. And, and it's just scratching the surface, right? And uh, uh, there is a lot more to be done, but these are uh, good uh, starting points for us to figure out how much more we can do to be more meaningful. I know that propensity, yes. propensity to be frauded sounds important, but also really depressing as well. <laughs> no, but that's that's reality, right? I mean, that's uh, reality if, for sure. Right? And it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's all about your behavioral patterns, and we know oh, sure. um, the, by based on the behavior that it's potentially possible, and that's where things can step in and say, okay, uh, can we get a little more stricter with with access for this for this particular ID, and then uh, try to control from. I think a, a certain uh, Singaporean bank would have benefited from having this uh, in light of recent cases. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for sharing that, Kanaks. Um, so maybe on the flip side a little bit, right? So we've been talking a lot about the upsides and, and, and the benefit of harnessing data and how it can help with customers and the bank business, right? Uh, on, on the flip side, you know, we live in a world where privacy concerns are growing, right? And consumers are increasingly being creeped out about how much big tech knows about this sometimes and you know I, I wonder you know for banks as well do we reach a point of personalization where it, it becomes creepy for the customer right so how do we kind of walk that fine line of being the customer's kind of partner in their financial journey and and, and not kind of creeping them out with 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 all these uh, kind of things. So i uh, open that question to the floor. Whoever would like to take this uh, question can unmute their mic and then I'll bring them up on stage. Uh, Heymans, yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, it's an interesting question because I think about it myself all the time because I mm -hmm. hate it when 
um, shouldn't name other brands, not banks, <laughs> but I hate it when some brands like just keep giving me uh, email just because I've done one transaction with them. So I think about that a lot. Um, I think there are a few things. First of all, uh, I first of all, I don't think we reached that point yet. Um, in terms of uh, providing personalization, uh, servicing comms and product and offers, we still have a long way to go to be appropriate because we're only number two and num we're only like two and three out of ten. I agree with Henry. So there are lots that we can do. But in terms of uh, not being overdoing it or hyper personalization, I think we need we really need to test it. Um, I the way that we we are doing now in the bank is. Uh, uh, we come up with hypotheses and then we identify a smaller uh, group of our among the, uh, all the customers and then we we'll test uh, and see the response uh, and then uh, we, we'll refine on it and then we'll test it to a bigger group and then we we'll test it again, test it again. Um, to understand the limit or to understand the, the sense uh, from customers. Uh, a lot of time I'm also cautious. I guess it's because I'm not originally from banking, as I said. So I realized a lot of bankers have some really deep rooted uh, ideas about how banks should be run and what customers want and need. Uh, and so we need to really test it out. Uh, so uh, that's one thing that I, I, I think it's important. And then another thing is um, we need to keep up with uh, regulations, requirements. Uh, and and regulations and regulators do have a lot of uh, clear guideline. Uh, uh, we need to be very careful that um, we we're complying to that, and also um, we get the trust from customers. I think financial industries is one of the top industries that do not have the trust from customers. <laughs> People just don't like us. People just think we are like scammers or anything. So I think that's important to also look at protecting your brand uh, and being able to build the trust in the things that you do. Uh, or in terms of on the trust front, I'm, al I'm always more conservative. I'm always more protective of let's make sure we're not hurting our trust with our customers. Uh, I would rather get more consent than less. Uh, where at least that's how, because it's, it's a very new topic and, and it's very important. I'm sure in the next five years, that would be like the core topic. Uh, but for now, I guess we're all just learning. Yeah, I just want to share. So it's consensual personalization then. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Heymans. Uh, before we move on to taking one more question from the audience, would anyone else from the panel like to uh, chime into this subject? Uh, yes, sure. Harry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, Heyman's a spot on. Look, um, it's really important to be as relevant uh, and as useful to your customers as possible. You know, we we often, you know, we joked at the top of the panel about how, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, banking services um, have heretofore, as long as you're, you know, not getting in someone's way uh, of doing something, then, you know, people have, have grown satisfied with, what to expect of a bank. But this is where, again, we have to be able to apply technology that then, of course, takes makes use of data and because there's so many points and sources of data we can use to figure out how to best serve our customers. And that's the ultimate aim. Um, you know, relevancy is that fine line in terms of of, you know, uh, I'll maybe I'll use another example I had before, you know, I, I enjoy a good cocktail and maybe <laughs> if the bank figures out that I, sp I spend a lot at all these great cocktail bars, all of a sudden starts pushing cocktails on me, that's probably going too far. But if you applied that same sort of feedback loop or behavior model for something else like concerts or things like that, I would generally be satisfied, right? So it, it's not just the, the science of data that you can put to use, you still have to have real people, your your marketing team in there, really thinking about how to build these these correct what I'll call feedback loops, right? Because uh, you still need judgment. You know, these tools are extremely powerful. They they can uh, obviously open a whole new world of opportunity when it comes to serving customers better. Uh, but the the art part of of marketing of creating products, uh, and this is you know oftentimes 
there's the banking definition of products, you know, but but the tech version of product really all really comes at it more from a UI UX perspective, um, and getting that customer experience right in terms of product, uh, and and of course our main touch points in a lot of the particularly neo banks is the app itself. But even how the app integrates with other channels of communication is really key because, you know, there's nothing worse than disjointed messaging where the app is doing great, but the email campaign or maybe you're using some of the messaging uh, platforms seems dissonant with what you're getting through the app, right? So the challenges of making, again, this totally holistic view of a customer, uh, getting the art right in terms of what to really present and, and, and and what the data, taking what the data is telling you to do versus the final idea of implementation, uh, I think is still critical. So this is not just about reliance on technology and data and what it can offer. It's, you know, you still have to have a, a really spot on good uh, product and marketing team to do this right. I think you described it quite well, right? It's also an art as well. But I, I challenge the notion that if a bank recommends me more cocktail places, I'd be uncomfortable with that. I'd be really grateful. I don't know. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for your views, Henry. Um, Kanak, Kanak, you've unmuted your mic. Do you want to add something? Yeah, no, I, no it's important. Uh, okay. I just want to build on okay. what Henry and Hamans have, uh, have mentioned, right? And I think uh, mm. uh, the only couple of points I want to say is there's a very a uh, thin line between creating a flywheel effect and uh, moving into a law of diminishing returns, especially when it comes to communications. And uh, uh, and Henry was, was spot on with uh, with the channels. You can't have have uh, uh, a disjointed experience when it comes to uh, personalized experience. You can't say, well, I'll only do this across my online and mobile channels, but then spam the customer on uh, on your emails or on SMS. Uh, it completely uh, misses the misses the boat. So, uh, you know, going back to uh, Kotler's four Ps, you need to know what is your positioning, what is the place, and your your proposition, as well as uh, you know what time you're going to meet the customer. You can't send him an SMS at twelve in the midnight, uh, even your system is probably the, the least busy at that point of time, right? So, so you got to there is an art to this. I absolutely agree with uh, with Henry on that. You know, and and it's. The only way you can really mature is, is by testing and learning on a continuous basis. But once you test and learn after three three tries, you, you would have learned, you would have figured out a model that is going to be continuously evolving and is ready to run. And that, and that, that works. So, yeah. Uh, 12 o'clock may be arguably the best time to send cocktail recommendations, but then again, that's another topic for another day. <laughs> So that uh, unfortunately we've kind of run out of time. Um, I'm not sure if we can take any more questions for the audience. I, I do apologize for that. We got carried away with the discussions. It's been a very good one. Um, maybe let's um, do some closing thoughts from each speaker, and then uh, we will wrap up the session. Um, maybe we can start with Dorel, Henry, Hamans, and then uh, Kanax. Dorel, go ahead. What what yeah, is your, your final thoughts for us? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, just I would add maybe another P uh, to Canucks, and I think it's to be precise and to be proactive. Uh, but I definitely appreciate uh, what you said, and uh, and I think that's you know from our perspective, from Personetics and the way that we partner uh, with with banks uh, all over the world is exactly around these kind of uh, challenges and helping them to uh, to really again to leverage the, this data. Uh, but also to become much more relevant and much more impactful and really to think about what makes sense and what's not. And because of that, you need a lot of, uh, you know, analytical models and you need, uh, you know, you need the tools to manage that uh, by yourself and to give the, the product people, the digital people, the ability to do that in a codeless manner. So I, I really appreciate that. But also I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the future. And I think, you know, digital banks like Timo and Marx and definitely CIMB leadership throughout the region, these are the ones that will really will drive the innovation forward. We'll think about uh, much better ways to engage with customers, look for their financial well-being, which is becoming really important today. We leverage additional data sets, look on open banking, open finance, uh, I think Hyman spoke about, you know, travel data, which is really interesting, um, and, and, and some others' data, and really try to, to, to provide a much detailed, uh, proactive, precise, uh, you know, value to their clients. Um, and I think that's, that's the relation, that's the, 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 the engagement that we are looking forward 
uh, today, how to drive the highest level of uh, not just satisfaction of engagement, also how to help customers to, as I said, move back and relax and don't think about their bank, like you said, Vincent. It's almost an invisible bank, if you will. Uh, and on the other side, I think, you know, banks are a business. So they need to better sell. They need to better service their customers. And I think that's also something that is important, how to provide the most personalized, relevant uh, 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 engagement and the most relevant context of providing a specific service or product. So th these are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. I appreciate it. Let's move on to Henry for his uh, closing thoughts. Henry, what are your closing thoughts for us? Sure. Um, I mean, Dur Durrell's totally spot on. I, I think in the end, there is a, a sea change that's occurring in, in the financial services industry. And, and thankfully, you know, technology has been a catalyst to this. Um, you know, Bill Gates, I think all of us very famously quote him uh, back in the 90s, has said, people need banking services, they don't need banks. Um, and part of that was, it was just generally an unsatisfying experience. If you go all the way back in time, I can remember my parents rushing to the bank on a Friday, you know, when I was a kid to try to make the 4 p.m. Like banks closed at 4 p.m., not even 5 p.m. rush, because if they didn't, they didn't have enough spending cash for the weekend, right? And so, you know, banks in that old school regulatory mindset have had customers bend to their rules. And I think there's a new set of rules now that have been brought about by technology. And I think, uh, you know, from a customer's perspective, it's going to be wonderful, right? Because it's going to be really become more easy, more relevant, much lower cost. Um, and just being able to just follow a customer's personal financial life journey better is just going to be an infinite improvement on what's happening now, right? To understand that someone gets their first job or saving for a vehicle or a home or first apartment or something, and being able to come right at those moments with the appropriate type of services and credit. Uh, it's, I know, ideally, we all talk about that and, and wanting to make that happen. But being able to get to the data, as Durrell said sometime, figure out what it's saying, put it into use, and then finally getting it out, uh, you know, to the customer and seeing what's working and not working and constantly improve that, that's that's the exciting future in front of all of us. So, Thanks for that, Henry. Some really good points brought up over there. Let's move on to Heyman. Heyman, what are your uh, final thoughts uh, for us for today? Yeah, um, totally agree with what Henry and Dorel said. I just want to add on two things. Number one, um, it's really a combination of art and science. Um, so it's, it's how we strive for the right balance. Uh, to, uh, you know, to provide the elegant, the relevant, the interesting, the engaging experience, but then at the same time, um, scientifically use the right data uh, to help us to make the right decision. So it's a combination of art and science. Uh, the number two point is, uh, I think the whole banking and financial industry has always been about the financial industry. It's not about customers. Uh, so that rushing to the bank at 4 p.m. is totally funny. Uh, but then even if because we, we are, we're looking into our payroll account. Have you ever thought about why is your monthly payment on that salary, it's paid on that certain day? Why can it not be the day that you choose instead of your employers or the bank choose? And um, someone who have worked in the banks forever, they told me some kind of history is because a long, long time ago, you know, this is a system and now this, and then I realized, oh, sh I realized, oh no. So it's all about the banks. It's not what convenient for the banks to do from operation perspective. It's not about what the customers want and what the customer choose. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it, it's just one simple example. And I'm sure a lot of things that we're accepting now as standard uh, will be changed because of data and technology. And so I am also very excited about the future as a customer of using financial services. But then as someone who's working in uh, financial services, I do want to see this change uh, because we are, it's, it's about time. We, we, we're almost living like in the dinosaur's age uh, because financial services has been so big and we, we've been making money. And so there's not much motivation to change, but now we're forced to change and we should. Thank you That's for the payments. Let's 
move on to Canux. Uh, last but not least, share your thoughts with us, Canux. Yeah, this is not the right time to go last um, because everybody has said everything. <laughs> Um, uh, so, I left uh, the biggest challenge to you. Yes, yeah, so, so I mean, see, um, and I, for me, I think Humans uh, uh, and Henry and Ronald have all mentioned all the facts that uh, that's that's in play in front of us. And to me, uh, if I look at banking, uh, uh, not necessarily banks. Uh, I think banking is moving into a domain called uh, cognitive banking, which is really around figuring out how to uh, work at the interplay of design technology data and behavioral science and really about using all this to make sense uh, of, of financial services for the customer. And uh, that's the next decade, uh, if you will. And uh, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting, challenging decade. For sure. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I think this has been a really good discussion. A lot of uh, very candid conversations, a lot of very good insights from all the speakers. So once again, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to share your views with us and the audience for tuning in. Uh, this session will be available on YouTube later if you guys want to rewatch it. Thank you all for tuning in and have a nice day. Goodbye.